Now, uh, this course, as you mentioned earlier, CST234 is network programming. Right? So basically what we're doing is that we're going to learn programming techniques to create network, network applications. Right? That means applications which are able to communicate with one another over the network, send and receive messages or data so they can perform some kind of function. Right? The most common type is that client-server. Client-server application. There must be a client, there must be a server. But of course, there are other types, peer-to-peer -peer and so on. But in this particular course, we're going to look at, or, we got, or rather, we're going to focus at client-server network, applica network applications. Right? So this is what it's all about we're going to do. So network application, in this case, will be applications or the programs which communicate with one another over a network, right? And so we have a client. So normally we have a client, we have a server. So let's qu quickly differentiate between the client and the server. The client basically is the one application or program which will try to get a service or a function from or make a request to a server, right? And the server is the one which is, will, be, will provide the service. Typical example will be the web, web browser and web server. We are, we are familiar with that. Uh, you, open your, you open up your web browser, uh, you type in your URL, and then your web browser will go to the server, and then show, display the pages, web pages from that particular server. So your browser will basically try to find out where is the, locate where is the URL, where is the, where is the particular web server? Go there, the, fetch the web page, and then bring it back to your machine, and then display on your application, which is your client or your browser. All right. So every client-server application basically works in the same way. All right. So the client will fetch, or try to before fetch, the client will try to seek out where is the server, try to find out where it is, locate it, go there get the data, bring it back, and then display. That's from a client point of view, all right? So the server point of view, what it will do? It will just wait, all right? So server will basically wait, and then see any client trying to connect or not. Server will just wait. If there is a client connection coming in, okay, ask the client, what do you want? Client say, okay, uh, I want web page number two. Okay, fine, you want web page two, I'll give you a web page two. I fetch the web page from my, from my database, then I send you back, send to this client. Service job is done, right? Next client comes, okay, I want page three. Okay, fine, I'll give you page three. So server, that's all server does. Server will only perform the duty as requested by the client. So client has to make the first move. If client don't do anything, server will keep quiet, right? So of course the server, has to be running, right? When the client starts, the server must be there. If the server is not running, the client comes up, try to make a find, try, try to locate where is the server, cannot find, okay, we can't, we can't, do, we can't do much, right? So server is normally, as you mentioned here, so the server application must be running a long running program. That means it must be running continuously. So most of the time, the server applications are running non-stop, right? So in Unix, uh, Terminology, we call it a daemon. Not the daemon, D-E-M-O-N, not daemon. Daemon is hantu. Right? A daemon, that means it's a long running program. Right? It's continuously running in the background, waiting for clients to connect so that it can do some function. Right? So the server will, will service the request from one or more clients. Right? So it doesn't mean that when you set up a server, it's only for one user. No. The server is for multiple users normally, right? So more, more clients coming in is okay, as long as it, can, it, can, it has sufficient capacity to, to fulfill the requests of the client. It's like you guys, I expected 20 students, 30 came. Okay, fine. Right? I can ask you to go back, isn't it? So 30 clients, 20 clients, no big deal. I still do one lecture. I don't have to repeat 30 times, luckily. Right? So same thing. So the, the server will basically serve, will, will, will make the uh, request the, uh, sorry, 
server will, will fulfill the requests from the clients as they come in, right? Number not important. Right, that's one. So we can have multiple, one client, one server, or most of the time there are multiple clients trying to connect to the server at one time. Right, so this is the first thing, the client-server concept. Second thing is that how the client communicates with the server. So there must be some kind of rules. How does the client find the server first place? Right, that's a different matter. How does the client make a request to the server? Right? What message do you use? What is the format of the message? Right, so this is where the application protocol comes in. Right, so for example, if you use a, a web page or web browser example, right, we use HTTP for example. That's the application protocol to communicate between client and the server. If you use other 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 uh, client server applications, for example, like email or even your Facebook, for example, then they have their own application protocol. What the, what the client can request and how the server is going to respond. Right? So all these things will be done by the application itself. Right? So an agreement on how the programs will communicate across the network. So there's normally the application protocol, the application layer. Of course, at the bottom layer, it will be using the internet model, the right? TCP IP, to communicate over network. We'll take a look at that too. So client-server paradigm is basically multiple clients and a single server, right? Now let's take a first, first example where, where, the, so where the client and server are located on the same LAN. So the next question will be that, okay, we have a client and we have a server, okay, fine. Where are they? Are they within the same area? nearby or they're far away, right? So if the client and the server are on the same, in the same LAN, that's easy. Of course, the, the, the mechanism is still the same, the method is still the same, but it will be faster and also easier to reach, right? So in this case, the client and the server are on the same LAN, means that they are on the same local network, same internet connection. Now, for example, this particular lab is one LAN, Right, about 30, about 40 machines here connected to one LAN. If I make one, I mean, if, if I make my iMac here as a server, and you all, you all are clients, then we are all in the same LAN. Right, we don't have to go to the switch outside. Right. But how, the, how the, but how the client communicates with the server? Again, we have to go through multiple layers on the TCP/IP. Right. So you have to go through the user, uh, the user top part go to TCP, the transport layer, the IP layer, then go to the physical layer. After that, only the, the data packets will travel over the local layer network to the server, and then it will go through in reverse again, go through the, the physical layer, and then go to IP layer, TCP layer, only then to the web, web server application itself. And, uh, basically, how it goes through the protocol stack. And the, the process is still the same. Except that the client and the server are on the same LAN, so it's, it's, it's more direct. However, most of the time, our servers are located far away, right? They are not on the same LAN. For example, if you open up your browser and say you want to go to Yahoo or Google, right? Now, this web, these websites are not in this particular lab, not even in this particular school, not even in this particular country, right? They're somewhere else. So they have to go through a worldwide network over the internet. So now there'll be a lot of hopping around to find, find the route from the client to the server application, right? So, have, so this, as we say, it will make use of routing protocols, right? So the TCP layer will make use, try to find out what other routers he has to go through from one router to another router until the server is found, right? Again, how he does that, that's not our problem. We don't have to, when we write our, our, when we write our client application, a server application, we don't worry, 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 worry about, we don't worry about that. That's handled by the lower layers. Right? Transport layer will do that. Luckily, we don't have to do that. Otherwise, it will be a mess. Right? 
Okay, as long as we're using TCP IP protocols, we are fine. The protocol stack on your machine will be able to handle those things. Right? How to find, how to find the server and so on. Okay. Okay. Now let's take a simple example. Well, this. How to create a client and a server applications. This is from the book, all right? So have you? Do you have it on your screen this one? Especially in the back, right? Because it's quite small here. All right. So what we're going to do is that we're going to take a look, take a look at how to create a simple client and server application. So what this client server application does is that the client will make a request to the server. The server's function is only one, very simple function. Server will, re will return the time of the day. So the client will say what time it is. The server, server will say, okay, it is now, it's now uh, 9.40 a.m. Tuesday, 18th of February, 19, uh, 2014. Right? That's what it says. So it was something like this. At the bottom, if you look at the bottom here, we will say the client, this is the client application. So the client application runs. And then you say, okay, this, this client is gonna, it will, it will, it will provide the IP address. IP address of the server, see? This client connect to this server. The server's IP address is 206.168.112.96, right? So the client will try, to, will try to connect to the server with that IP address. And if everything goes, works fine, you should, the client should receive a message from the server indicating what is the current time on the server, right? So this daytime service is simple. The client will, send, will, will make a connection to the server. Server will respond by sending the current time on the server. After that, job done. Right? That's all, okay? So this example shows us what are the, what are the basic building blocks of a client server application, right, in terms of sockets. So this is in C. Uh, are you familiar with this? Does it look familiar? Or does it look alien? Which one is it? Does, does it look a little bit familiar? You're familiar with C++, right? Are you? C++, yes. Ah, then it's something like that, without, without the plus plus. Right? Take out a plus plus, you can see. Right? So basically, we, we're not going to use any uh, any uh, as, uh, we're not going to use any interface functions and all these things. Right? It's just basically command line functions, simple ones. Okay, anyway, so if you see function, normally it will have a main program. Right? Just we have a main program. Open here, close here. So this is the whole program for a client. Okay, forget about this is basically declaration, integer, and so on. This is this is basically a variable name soc fd and and then it's in type integer, receive line is another variable, type of character, right? And then we have a server address, is type is the data type is is a socket address structure. Right? In C you can define structures. Are you familiar with structures? Yes? Ah, okay. Right? Basically, structure means you create, for example, you have standard structures, integer, character, pointer, long integer, and so on, right? If you want to use your own one, then you can, you can create your own one, right? Anyway, so this has been defined, right? So forget about this one first. So first, what will you do? For any client or server application, we need to create a socket first, right? So the command to create a socket is socket. Right, so the first line, line number 10. What it does is try to create a socket here. And then there are some parameters. How to, uh, what type of socket do you want? So in this case, we are creating a socket of IP socket, uh, IPv, uh, IPv4, internet version 4. And then we're going to create a socket uh, of type uh, TCP. Uh, later we will see this, all this thing, don't worry about this yet. So we're going to create an IP socket 
a TCP, type of TCP, and then the third parameter is zero, doesn't matter. So this function socket is the one which will create a socket. So if it is successful, the socket is created successfully, it will return a value. Right? So we check the value from the function. Soc FD is basically integer, right? So if everything is okay, our soc FD value, the value returned will be more than zero. If it's more than zero, that means socket has been created successfully. If less than zero, it's an error. Right? So this is what is what is line 10 and line 11 is trying to do. Right? Check for error. If the, if the return value is less than zero, that means the socket was not created successfully. Right? So the program should stop here because we cannot proceed. First thing to do must be able to create a socket. Okay. So now we have created a socket. Right? Socket is basically uh, it's, it's like a gateway. Uh, like, like a door, right? You want to go into a lab, there's a door. You must go through this particular door. And the door will have a number, right? So the socket will have a number. There will be a number assigned to it, which will be written. So once you create a socket, it will give you an ID, socket ID. So this socket ID is the one which is currently stored in the variable called soc FD. Right, SOC FD stores the current the socket ID, which is currently created. And this one will, will be used later on once we, we communicate with the server. Right. OK, so if everything goes well, we have created a socket now. Right? We have created a door. We have got a number for the door now. Now, the door must be connected to somewhere. You cannot put a door which goes out to the corridor or goes go down the floor. No, right? It must go somewhere. So, so we need to connect this particular door to the server now. So we need to connect this particular socket we just created, attach it to the server. Right? So the second part then. So now, so to connect to a server, we need two things. We need the server's IP address, obviously. Right? We need to know what IP address. And we also need the, the server's port number. Right? So in TCP, normally two things you need. To, to connect to a, a server, internet, or a server application, normally two things are required. IP address of the server and a port number of, it, of the server. Right? For example, it's like say when you open your browser, right? you key in your URL. Right? Uh, Google.com, for example. That's the name. The name will be converted later on to IP address. Right? We see that. And so IP address is already there. The port number is normally fixed. If you're using web service, HTTP, then the port number will automatically be 80. 80. Right? Because HTTP is to be fixed to be using port number 80. So in this case, okay, so first thing we need to do is that we need to identify or rather specify the server's IP address and port number. Now the server's IP address, when you write this program, you won't know, right? The server's IP address is supposed to be provided by the client, correct? Look at the example here at the bottom, right? When you, the client runs, it will provide the IP number of the server. So the IP number is supplied by the user. So this this client program has to capture this client program has to capture the users user supplied IP number. Right, so this is what, what it basically does. So first of all, it creates so it has created a structure called server address which which will, will try to store the server IP address and the port number, right? And first thing it does, the, the first thing it do is that line number 12, that it initializes the, the server structure. B0 means put, every, or put all zeros. Initialize everything to blanks, the whole structure, right? Next, since this is a structure, so the first element of the server address is the family. So that it must be of the same family, AF, INET. Basically, we are saying that we are trying to connect to the server who is the same family as the client, IPv4, right? Because earlier we created a socket of 
of the type AF INET. So the server family must also be the same. All right. And then the server's port number. Next thing we need to specify the server's port number. So in this case, the server's port numbers will be fixed at 13. Why 13? Because 13 has been reserved as a service a spot number to be used for daytime client service. Just like if you use a web browser, the port number 80 has been reserved for web service. So if you write if you if you if you write a if you write a browser client, you must put a port number 80 here because you are you are default browser. You are going to use HTTP. Here we're going to use a daytime service. So daytime service has been fixed at port number 13. So we know that the server will be running on port number 13. Right? Okay, so we just sign port number 13 into the port number. All right, and then we there is some conversion involved. 13 will be converted into a proper format by this function uh, HTONS before it's stored into the server structure. All right, again, don't worry about that. We'll take a look at how it's converted you know, later on. Next, so we got the family type, we got the port number. Now we need the IP number of the server itself. All right? So IP number of the server comes from the user. When the user runs the client program, it will provide the IP number of the server. So we will capture this. So in C program, the main, there are, in the, when you run the main program, there are two variables here. And these variables can be used to get the user arguments. Which we, this is called the user argument. Right? The data supplied by the user when they run the program. Right? So this is the code you use. So argument one, ARGV, argument one is this one. This argument zero. That means this the, we don't need this. We need argument one, which is the IP address supplied by the user when the program runs. Right? So argument one is this variable will contain the IP number. So basically take this IP number, take this value, and then put into the server address, IP address. Right? Store inside, convert, and all these things. We need to convert again the IP numbers given here. You convert that into the proper type before storing to the particular server. It will also check that this IP number is, is valid. Right? You, you normally have four dots. If you put five dots or three dots or two dots, you will say there's no, it's error. Right? You, will, you will try to validate the IP number. Make sure it is a, it is a valid IP number. Right? So that's the, that's the function of, that's the job of this particular function. Again, we will be looking at it later on. Uh, so we've got a family type, we've got the port number of the server, and we've got the IP number of the server. Okay, now we're ready. Uh, we have created a socket. We know the details of the server. Now we need to connect this particular socket and then to the other side. Right? So that's the next second type. So then to so specify a server's IP address and port, convert the port server address to the proper format. And then we try to establish connection with the server. So this is the one, this part is done by line number 17. Connect. So what we're we gonna do, we're gonna connect the socket we have created earlier. Right? Remember the socket ID we got from the socket function. Socket FD is basically from here. So we use the socket ID and then we're gonna connect it to what? We're gonna connect it to the to the server address, which, which is a structure which contains all the information about the server, which we have put in earlier. The type, the port number, and the IP address. Right? So it's already in the server address structure. So we're going to connect this socket to this server. Right? And say connect. So this function connect is a special function. Right? It will try to connect to the server on the other side, establish connection and see whether it's successful or not. Again, if everything goes okay, no errors, value 
the return from connect is more than zero, that means everything is okay. A connection has been established between your client and your server now. Right, so the connect function basically establishes connection between the client and the server. Right. So now there is a there is already a path between the client and the server. Right. Let me just draw it out for you. So we have a client. Right? So client. So first thing to do is create a socket. Alright? Create a socket. Then socket is just empty first. Then we need to provide information about the servers. The IP number, the port, and so on. And others. Right, so we create, 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 empty, um, create an empty socket first. After that, we put in the information of the server. What is the server's IP number, port number, and the uh, other information. Once this is ready, then only it will try to establish connection with the server. Right, so this is where the connect comes in. Connect will be here. The socket, the function socket is here. This is a bit small, I know, but uh, so the function socket is creates a socket. The function connect, if everything is okay here, then you will try to connect with the server using the information put into the structure just now. So if the IP address is wrong, you will go to some other server. If the port number is wrong, it might go to some other port, right? So everything must be okay. If everything okay, if it's established, the IP number server is correct. The server also running at a particular port, right? This port number is the same, and so that means the client socket can connect to the server. If it's okay, now we are connected. So now we are connected means that the client is can is already established connection with the server. The server is responding and say, okay, I'm server say a client connection come from the client. The server say, okay, I'm ready to accept you as your connection. Right? So that's up to here. Next thing after that, once the connection is established, now the client can send information to the server. Right? So in this case. Since, in this case, since the service is very, very simple, the client does not send anything, anything to the server. The client makes a connection to the server, and then the server is supposed to reply with the current time on the server. So what the client needs to do is just read the data sent by the server. Right? Right? That, that's, that's what it's supposed to do. So after connection, establish connection with the server, just read and display the server's reply. So here, what, what it's trying to do, it, so after connection is established, everything is successful, the client will try to read the socket now. Read the socket. That means the server will reply the message on the, on the socket itself. So the socket is basically like a highway now. Right? So the messages will be transmitted between the server and the client on this particular socket. So if the client wants to receive data from a, from a server, it will read the contents of the socket. It will read from the socket. If the client wants to send data to the server, it will write the data onto the socket. After connection has, after connection has been done, and everything is established, then it just read and write to the socket and you can communicate with the server itself. So in this case, we only need to read. So we're waiting for the server to send us something. So the client basically reads, try to read the socket, and then the contents will be put into a buffer called receive line. And then max line is the number of characters we want to read. 
how many characters we want to read, maximum, right? 30, 40, or whatever it is. And then we read, right? So this, this, this function socket, read means you will try to read from this socket. If everything goes again, goes, goes well, the number of characters read is more than zero, means we are fine. That means something has been received from the server. Right? So if n is more than zero, what are you going to do? We have read the contents from the server. Now we display the message from the server onto the terminal. So we will display the contents sent by the server onto the monitor, right? onto the sender output. So basically just we put whatever the contents of the buffer we received earlier, put it the buffer onto the standard output. Line number 21, right? Standard output is your terminal. So we'll display the contents read from the socket onto the terminal itself. Right? If you cannot put it, some error, and you put error in all these things. That's all. Right? So the client is very simple. Few things you do. First, create a socket. Then, fill up the information of the server, the IP number, server's IP address, server's port number into a, into a server structure. And then we connect the socket to the server. After that, we read, we read the, the contents, we read the reply from the server itself. And then display the server's reply onto the screen. All right? We will see that how, how it runs afterwards. Now this one gives us a, a different version. Same client, except that if our server is running on IPv6, right? You know the difference between IPv6 and IPv4, right? The main thing one, main thing is that it has a different IP number, right? IP address in IPv6 is 100, 128 bits. IPv4 is 32 bits, right? So, this, so what basically is that, is that the server address, the server structure will be different now. The server structure has to be large. So what is what this program trying to show is that between IPv4 and IPv6 version, the client version, the changes are very very minimal. It only concerns the server address, and the the family type will be changed now. Earlier was AF INET, now it's INET 6 to say that this is IPv6 version. Right? And then the family type has changed. And then that's about all. Wherever INET is used, we use INET 6. And then the address we use, we use IPv6 address. The rest of the code is still the same. Right? Again, don't worry about too much here. We'll, we will come back to this later on. Now next, we take a look at uh, briefly a wrapper function. Now wrapper function is something like this. You know wrappers, right? The picture at the bottom, a chocolate chocolate wrapper, right? You Cadbury or whatever it is, right? You wrap a, a, a chocolate in a, in a wrapper, right? So you only see a certain part of it. You don't see the whole thing, right? So the whole idea of a wrapper function is that we try to hide hide some of the code of the function itself. Right? So if you go back, for example, the socket here, this part. We create a socket, so this is the basic function. We create a socket, and then we, need, we check the errors, whether the socket has been created properly, whether it's error. If, this, if the return value is less than zero, then we have to put the error code. Right? So each time we call a socket function, or any client server application function, we have to check for the error code. What the wrapper function will do, it will hide all these things into a, a new function. Right? So we will create a, a new function socket, but with this capital S. Right? What it will do is, it does the same thing, except that we do it in, in a special function, in a new function. Right? So again, we call the socket family type of protocol. In this case, we supplied by the argument, the parameter, and then same thing. So how, now what we do is we just call this socket FD, and then we don't use a small s, we use a capital S. And after that, we don't check for errors in our main program, because the errors has already been checked inside this newly created function. 
right? So the example will be like, yeah. So we clear. So now we do we just we say socket capital S and that that's it. We don't have the error code anymore. Really. So compare this example line ten with the previous example here, right? So these two lines has been compressed. Right, has to be combined into one single line, make, it, make our main program much easier to read. Right. So it hides, it basically hides the error code inside a, a new function. So in this particular programming example, the given, given pro, in this particular example of uh, programming code given by the textbook, we have two types of functions, the small and the capital. Right? If you use the capital function, capital letter, in the beginning, that means it is a wrapper function. The error code has already been checked inside. Right? If you use a small one, if you use a small, uh, small letter socket, then you will have to write your own code. Then you have to use, write your own code to check for the errors. Okay? If you use a capital S, then it has been, so this is new, so, so the, the function socket with capital S is a newly created one which incorporates or includes the error, function, error checking code. Right? So that, that's the difference. So it makes our program much easier to read. Okay, now let's take an example of the server now. So we have, we have an example of the client application just now. Now we take a look at a server application. So server application, what do we need to do? Again, same thing. First, we need to create a socket. So server also must create a socket, right? So the server must also create a socket inside. Yeah. Right. So server must create a socket. So again, the socket type is what? Again, is the family type. I. Uh, AFINet, which is basically the IPv4, and then the TCP socket, and then the zero. Okay, fine. And we so the, the listen FD is basically the socket uh, ID, right? We call it listen FD. So we created a socket on the server. Next thing is that we need to attach, or rather, attach the socket with the its IP number and port number, right? So again, IP number and port number of the server itself, right? So again, first of all, we put initialize all the values zero in the structure. The family type is AFNet, same thing. The server's address now will be, we put as in address any, meaning that we say we are saying that the server's address can be any address assigned to it. Now we're not going to say use this particular IP number for the server. Whichever has been assigned to the server, we take it. The default IP number in other words for the server. Alright? So this is what it means. Take the default IP number assigned to the server and then use that and put inside the, the structure. Next thing is the server's port number. So the server must also run in service on a port number. So which port number you must use? So since again, daytime server, it uses 13, right? Now notice that the client and server must communicate using the same port number, right? Because the port number, we, the socket on the client side, we create a socket and then we assign the IP number and port number, right? We assign 13 here, and the IP number of the client is basically IP number where he wants to connect to the server. On the server side, again, we have the same structure. So we have the IP number, and then we have the port number, and then other things. So IP number of the server, we take whatever default IP number assigned to the server. We are not going to fix it, right? And then port number we fix, 13, to make sure that the client and server uses the same IP number. 
right? Okay, that's what it does. After that, for server, there's a special function called bind now. Right, so this bind function basically attaches attaches the the server's information to the port number. To, sorry, to the socket we have created. So bind means binds the server's well-known port to the socket. Right. So we need this function, and then we start the service of listen, meaning that now the server is. After the socket is created, it's, a, it's a attached to the IP number and port number of the server, then the server must start actively listening to the port for incoming connections from the clients. Right? So now, so now the server so now the server must must be alert on this particular port, oh, sorry, on this particular socket. Because it has created a socket, right? So it's created a socket. Now, because it is a server, it must be ready to receive connections from the clients on this particular socket. So it must go into listening mode. So that it runs a, list, it runs a listen function on the socket which it has, it has created earlier, right? So now it's listening, waiting for connection to come. Now, if a client now clear, a client tries to connect to the server now, right? That's when it will. So if there is an incoming connection comes in, it will try to accept, accept the connection. Right, so there's, there's another function now. Right, accept client connection and then send reply. So there's a function called accept. So we listen on this. We are we are listening. Uh, this is a listen uh, uh, socket. So once the socket has been running, if the client if the client connection comes on this particular, if there's any activity on this socket, then it will accept, and then it will create a new connected socket ID. It will create a new ID. Right. So now that means once this accept is been done, so now our client and server are connected. So now our client and server are connected. Right? So that means now the client and server can communicate using that particular socket after the accept is done. So once that is done, then the server will Remember the sub, remember of this remember this, the 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 job of this daytime server was to if it receives an uh, incoming connection from a client it will send its current time right so the server will send the current time on the server to the client so what it does is that basically it will try to get what is the current time this is the function c time and then get a current time convert the current time into c, uh, use this function get the current time and then uh, format it into a proper format and put it into a buffer right I put it put in a buffer and then then write this particular buffer to the socket that means it gets the current time from the system then it will write the current time into a buffer and then write write the buffer to the socket so once the server writes the, con the buffer to the, to the socket, then means that information will be sent to the client. So client will be able to read the contents later on. All right? After that, once that is done, then the server can close the connection because that's what you want to do. A client comes, a client connects, the server will just get the current time, send the reply, that's it. My job is done. Until next client comes, and then I repeat the process again. So that's what this, this loop is, right? But it's always listening, right? So listening mode is still there. It's always in listening mode, 
a new connection comes in, it will set the connection, get the current time, put it into a buffer, proper format, and then send the data onto the socket, right through the socket. So then the client will receive, and then you just close the connection and then wait for the next one, wait for next incoming client connection. Okay. Right. So anyway, so this is uh, the beginning example for client-server communication. Right. I know it's, it's a bit uh, different, so you need to get familiarized with this. Right. So take a look at how the functions are done. The book, the textbook gives you a good explanation of each line of the code, what it does, how it does it. So read that and understand it, how it works. This basically tells you in the TCPIP model where is the socket. Right, we talk about socket, socket, sockets, but where it is. It's basically, if you remember TCPIP model, it has five, uh, sorry, four layers, right? The application layer, the transport layer, the network layer, and then the the the, the physical layer at the bottom, right? So the sockets are basically between the application and the transport layer, right? So we. So application layer, we call the user process, right? Anything below that is called the kernel. It's basically the OS, really. right? So the socket is basically connects an application to the lower layers. Right? So that's, that's our window. That's our door to connect to a lower layer so that we can communicate with the other side, right? So the communication details will be all be inside here. So the function socket just now, if we look at it, right, for example, like this, how to create a socket, how to connect all these things, all the details are basically inside the function. How you go to find out where the server is, how do we establish connection, all this, all are within that. Right? We, we, we will be looking at it, the details of that later on. Now a little bit of uh, Unix history, right? Since we are using Unix in this particular course, uh, we will be using BSD most of the time because that's the one that comes with the uh, iMac, right? So BSD is one of the most common uh, uh, Unix uh, used, right? The free version of it, uh, the free BSD here. So it is. It's a long. It's a long process from 1970s until 1980s to establish to to uh, to create different versions of Unix and then comes out with the TCP IP incorporated into it, network details and all these things. Right, so there are many, many releases, many versions and all that. Right, so until the end, we have this, at the end we have the free BSD and all these things. Of course, there are other, other Unix standards, right, just, just for your information. Right, so there's the POSIX, Right, developed by IEEE, and then there was another one, the open group, which was basically a group of vendors and the application developers, or so industry and government. They tried to get together and try to build a common Unix, right, which is standardized. So they we come, they come up with their own standard, X open, and, and then they introduce the single uh, Unix specification version three and all that. Right, again. The early days. Then, of course, we have the BSD, right? So BSD was first publicly available TCP/IP stack implementation of the Unix itself. So it it, it incorporates internet networks and internet in, inside it. So sockets was already provided those times from then. And this has been used as a as a basis as a base for commercial Unix. Uh, systems so like Unixware, Solaris, and then even the AIX used by the uh, by the iMac, they all come from based on this. Right? Each one have their own implementation. And finally, we have the the Linux version, right, which we are familiar with. Right? Again, this is basically a free version of Unix. So they're not based any they're not strictly based on any standard but they provide compatibility with the previous versions on Unix. Right, so you have 
Red Hat, Linux, Ubuntu, Fedora, and all this thing. They are basically the different packages. Right? So this is basically just for your information. Now another thing which we need to familiarize ourselves, or rather be aware of that is that there are different standards when we connect on the socket and all this. So 32 bits or 64 bits, right? Just like you have your 32-bit OS or your 64-bit OS, or you have a 32-bit machine, the older ones, or 64-bit machines, the newer ones. So there's a difference in their data structures. So we have to be aware of that. So a network connection can be from a client, normally client to a server. So the client can be either 32-bit or 64-bit, and the server might be a 32-bit to 64-bit, right? So the problem arrives the problem arises if they are not compatible. Right? For example, I'm 32, I'm, I'm, I'm your server, right? You are client. Now, if, if you are 32 bit, you, I'm 32 bit, fine. You 64, I 64, fine. No problem. But let's say if you are 30, running 32 bit, right? I'm running 64 bit. When you send data to me, I have no problem. Because you send 32 bits, I 64 bits wouldn't be that much of a problem. But when I send data to you, I send you 64 bits, you can only reach 32 bits. So you have a big problem. Because some of the data will be lost. You cannot reach 64 bits. Right? Or I'm running 32 bits, you're sending me data 64 bits. Again, big problem. So if they're not running on the same model, then we have, we have a problem. Again, the, the point is that the client and server must be aware of which model they are using. So they must use the same one. Right? Again, we will take a look at how to do this later on. Right? So the socket APIs normally use specially defined data types to avoid problems with this kind of issues. Right? So the example given in your book and all this thing, you try to avoid these kind of things. Main, main problem is here, right? So for example, you know you're familiar with this, right? The data type character, short, integer, long, and pointer, right? So you have a short character, your how many bits are represented for one character? So it's normally eight bits, right? So it doesn't matter which model you use, if you define your 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 uh, variable size character, then we're okay. Short integer normally is 16 bits. Integer is normally 32 bits. The problem comes with a long integer. Right? So if it's a 32-bit model, then the long is only 32 bits, but uh, in a 64-bit model, the long integer becomes 64-bit. Right? So you send 64, I'm expecting, you, you send 30, 32, I'm expecting 64. Or I send you 64, you're only expecting 32. That will be the problem comes. Okay? But anyway, so this is normally handled behind the scenes, but the thing is that main thing is when you write your socket programs, you have to be aware of these things. Okay? All right. Okay, let's do some exercise and see how this works. All right? Do you get that? Everyone? Right? Okay. So now we are in business. All right, so now we're going to do is that, okay, go back to your folder. <coughs> <coughs> go back to your, go back to your folder, CS234, go into your UNDP, this one. Uh, there is a readme file here. There should be a readme file, this one. You see this? Double click on that. Oh. Okay. No, it doesn't work this way. Wait, hold on. Um, okay, use this then. Uh, you can use text edit. Click on this one, the spotlight, type text edit. There should be a text edit here. Right, so text edit. Try to open the readme file. 
find where it is. Uh, desktop. Try to find a readme file. Open readme file. Say open. OK, now we get it. Everybody got that? Okay, well, hang on then. Oh, <laughs> terminal in there. Yeah. Okay, then you. Where is she? You type in terminal. Right. Ah, type, 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 terminal. Other, other, other. Ah, other. Anyway, I think it's nice, but little. Uh, yeah? Open, open. Text file, open. Ah, open, uh, open, open. Ah, find where it is. Read me, read me. Down, down. I don't know. It should be in the main one. Ah, that one. Okay. Okay. Hey, hey. Anyone? All got open readme file, right? All got readme file? Yes? Okay, you should have two, one readme file and make sure you, readme file and the terminal console must be there. Huh? We need these two things then. Okay, so what do we do? Readme file? Read. It says read me, right? So you're supposed to read and do something. Okay, this is what you need to do. Okay, let's. I'm trying to make it a bit. See, if you have put side by side, it's better, right? Okay, so what you need to do is that follow the instructions. Say, execute the following from the source directory. Okay, first, before we go there, now this, so now there are a bit, bit of Unix commands to learn. So, first, we find out where we are. All right. I'm going to write a few uni common Unix commands you need to know. All right. So one will be pwd, which is a uh, uh, current directory. All right. CD something to change directory. CD decides to go back, reverse back, and then LS. LS will be to, uh, to list files, view files, and then will be a uh, make. So this one is basically something. All right. Let me just let me just write it right down for you. So this one is view view current directory. Change directory uh, go back to previous directory. This is list files in list files. This one is to compile program. C program. Okay. Anyway, anyway, we will we will be looking through this later on once we come uh, as we learn more. If you go to your, if you go to your.
you go to your uh, e-learning, I think I have put a few sample code here. Um, uh, here, basic Unix commands, right? So this is a PDF file you can download later and then you can uh, try it out. Some simple commands like the one shown on the, bo shown on the board. Okay, anyway, so coming back to this, so what you need to do, PWD tells you what directory we are currently, right? So when you do ls, it will tell you to show you. So what you see is desktop, documents, so this is basically what you're seeing on here. Right? So to go, we need to go to this particular folder, right? So to go to the folder, we, this, fol this folder is in de on desktop. So first we need to change, change to desktop, right? You can ls again, <coughs> right? Now we need to go to CST. This one, right? You know, there's so many things. Then you should, you should, you, then you go need to go to do this UNPP. All right. So make sure everyone gets this. You are change directory until you reach here. Your 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 code. All right. So first we change go from uh, desktop. Then desktop. Go to this one. First folder, then go to yeah. All right, everybody there? Yeah, okay. Now we follow. Let me just clear this first. Okay. So now we, we follow the instructions given in the README file. All right. First thing you do is this one. Uh, dot slash configure. Then you follow cd lib make cd to colon so basically we need to do all this all this until here so one two three four makes we need to do okay okay let me just un do until here all right so we are there so what you do is just follow this oops And you should get something like this. Right? So the first one done, right? This one done. Then we go to do this, second one. So we do this. Let me just clear again. Then we say make. Okay, it's very fast. <coughs> right? Then again, same thing. Just, 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 just follow that. Follow the instructions given in the readme file. You get some error, doesn't matter. Then the other one. Then, then the last one.
in the last one doesn't work. Okay, in the last one is not there. Okay, the last one. All right, the, the, uh, the last one doesn't work. It's not there. So up to here only. All right. So do this thing. The, the configure cd lib make, cd lib free make, cd lib root make. Right, make, 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 make. Right, this, what, what, it do, what it's doing is that basically it's trying to compile the source code, right, the libraries and all that. We only need to do this once at the beginning. After that, we do, after that, later you come, on, you come and do, you won't have to do this anymore. Right, assuming your, your CSD234 folder doesn't get lost. Otherwise, you will repeat that, okay? It's all done, right? Yes? Anybody not? Haven't done? Okay, all done. Okay. Then we are ready to compile our first program. To run our first program. So this one you can throw away really. Okay. Um, so if we go back to our code. Right, so we need we are we are gonna run these two programs. This client and this server, right? So where are they? They are in a directory called intro, intro, right? So where are we now? We are here, right? Make sure you are here. If you are somewhere else, come back here. Right? Use the CD backslash or whatever it is to come back to here. Maybe some of you were here just now, I think. Where were you all? Live free. Was it live free? If you all were here, then just come back like that. All right, check PWD. We get back to here, all right? Then we go into intro. Just double check where we are. Yes, we are here. Right, so let's change, the, go to intro directory. And then we can look at the programs. There are a number of programs here. Right, if you go, go to this folder, so you can see, right? I'm going to open this one now. This one, you go into. Uh, Go into intro, right? You can see all these things. List of them, right? Same thing. Okay. Okay. Everybody here? Everybody here in this directory? Yes. Okay. Then what we're going to do is that now before we run the program, we need to compile it, right? So in Unix, you need to compile program before you can run. Let me just clear this stuff. Okay, so what you need to, comp to, to compile is to make. Make and then the file name. So the file name is this one. Daytime TCP client. Right, the first one here. So daytime. Right? Then you just enter. Okay, mine is already compiled, so no problem. Can you do yours? You should say you should do some okay, hold on. Alright, so we'll make again. You get something like this. Right? 
Correct? Then you do the same thing for for server. So you need to make for two, client and the server, right? Uh, okay, now I forget about this one. All right, you should get uh, should be okay for you. You should get something like this, uh, like this. All done? Everyone done? Okay. Okay, now what you need to do is we need to need open two windows. This is one window, we need to go to terminal, shell, new window. New window, okay, basic. Right, try to open another window. We need two windows, one for client, one for server, easier that way. So again, where are we? We'll be here, okay, so we need to do, again, same thing, go to desktop, CST, UNP, we can do it. Uh, and then, all together, so can. And then we need to go to intro. Okay. Right? So make sure that both windows we are in the same directory. This also we are there. Right? Everybody there? Anybody not there? Let me know. Okay, let's. So make sure you have two windows, both in the same directory intro. Right? So now we, we, are, we are ready to run the program. Alright? So, so which program you should run first? Client or server? Client? Which one should run first? Server, isn't it? Okay. So. Server should be left or right? It doesn't matter, isn't it? Anyway, so so to run the server, we we follow this one. If you look at the code, this one. The server will be daytime TCP server, right? So you need to do this. Daytime TCP server, All right? Did you get that? Okay, okay fine. So I think most of you get permission error. Okay. I have cracked mine at least. Okay, why are you getting this error? Let's okay, now you open your code. Uh, go and find your source code. This one, go and find this particular file, daytime tcp server.c. You can use the text edit. Open Where is it? Come on. I, I can't see the mouse on my screen, but it's visible on, on the on the I can't see on my monitor, but it's visible here. <laughs> You need to look at the C file, eh? the program file. This one. Okay. So what do we see? Look at this. Because the thing is this one. You have the server, the, the port number is 13, right? Now the thing is, if, if anything, if the port number is below 1024, it will not accept. More than 1024, right? 
So change this port number. Change the port number, right? Change the port number, then you save it. File, save, right? Then open, you also need to open the another one, uh, the client, daytime client C. So make sure the client also using the same port number. Right? Server. The server.c running port number. And then the client C also must have the same port number. Right? Change this. Save. Right? Once done that, go back to your window again and recompile. How to recompile? This one. Make. Make daytime TCP client, right? Make daytime TCP server. Right? Okay, so make, make changes in the C code, as mentioned earlier. Make changes in the C code for server and client. Make sure the port number is more than 1024. Here and here. Client and server, save it. Go to your terminal window. Recompile the client. Recompile the server. Right? So now we should be able to run. You can use the up, 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 arrow, up arrow and bottom arrow to, to get your previous, previous commands. That's what I'm using. Oops. Okay, so let's start again, right? So let's now we run the server. Sorry, okay. So let's run the server like this. So when you run, it should be like this, right? So the server is not doing anything currently because it's, what it's doing is waiting for the client to connect. That's why the server is waiting now. So now we go to the other window and we run the server. I'm oh, sorry, we run the client. So daytime, daytime TCP client, right? We do this, it will tell you that you need to supply the IP number of the server, right? So then we give a sub IP number of the server, which we use as a default. This is basically a, a loopback IP number, loopback address. So we do this, and you should get that. So you should get a reply from the server telling you what is the current time and date. Right? If you run the client again, you will get your time updated. Right? The server is running, you see? Now if you want to, if you want to terminate the server, you press Control C. I go to this, this one, I press Control C. Control C, it will terminate the server now. Server no longer, no longer running. Now, if I try to run the client again, what should I get? Of course, connection error, right? Connect error because it's trying to create a socket, try to connect to the server. There's no server exists. 
Like the server is not running. OK? Then you can start the server again. Server is running. Now you do a client, and then you, you'll get an answer. Right? This is this is that means your client is is communicating with a server which is on the same machine, right? So I can also supply. If you go under here, go to your the Apple icon there on the top left. You go under System Preferences. And then you go under Network. You can see your IP number of this machine, right? So instead of using 12710, I can use this IP number. 10.207.131. This is my machine. Huh? So I should also get that. Right? So if you want to see your friend's server running or not, check the IP number of your friend's server and then try to try to connect to that particular user's name, 89. There's no 89 here. Okay, so to, if you want to try your, your friend's IP, uh, server, then make sure you, your server is not running. You, 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 you terminate your server, run your client, and then try to call your neighbor's server and see what happens. Right? Make sure the neighbor's server is running. Right? Okay, anyway, we are finished for today. Right? That's all.